Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. Well, here on the bench today, we have a sickly Tandy 102. And I'm actually doing this intro kind of in the middle of the project, which is a little weird, but I forgot to do it at the beginning. I've actually been working on this guy for all four or five weeks now, on and off as I've had time. And I've kind of to the point here, we're making some progress and ready to start on a more involved testing step. So I thought this was a good time to kind of wrap up this first video and we'll see what the progress was and that type of thing and we'll jump into the video now and after that's done i'll come back and we'll wrap it up and talk about what's coming in part two thanks to pcb way for sponsoring this video they do circuit boards of all sizes small circuit boards medium circuit boards they can even assemble them for you be sure to check out their website and the fourth design contest, which is running right now. So head on over to PCBWA for all of your PCB needs. So here we have our model 102. Pull this guy out of here. And he has included a new ribbon cable or this looks like maybe it is, yeah, it's a used one. That's fine. And uh, visually, everything looks fine. Battery compartment looks fine. Okay, I use external power from the bench power supply. That way I can monitor the current draw. Just to see if anything looks hinky. Got that plugged in. Center negative. Output on. Power on. Yeah, it's not booting up. About 150 milliamps. That's kind of high. Yeah. Power switch feels a little odd too. Okay. Take a peek inside. There we go. Comes off like that. Oh, it's the keyboard cable that he was having problems with. The LCD folds out like this. Kind of like a book. And... Before I unplug that guy... My black Sharpie seems to have evaporated. This green one's not very dark, but it will do the job. There's only one way that can really go in there, but it doesn't hurt to mark it. There we go. Okay. Get that paper out of there. Have a look at our board. Yeah, they're all like this with all these bodge wires on here. Got a few screws to take out. We can go ahead and pull our keyboard cable there. Oh yeah, that one's kind of crinkled up right there. See the way these are bunched up? That could be, oh, and some of these are loose, if you can see that. So that could be causing it to short out inside the keyboard connector, which might cause problems. Okay, and he said he had replaced the battery. Wasn't sure about the solder joint, so we'll have a look at those. I 
That thing looks too out of place on here. Yeah, I think on the solder joints for the battery, I'll touch this up again. Those are hard to do. Because it's hard getting the whole board hot enough. And it looks like the old battery was leaking some. Not too bad. I think for a quick test, we'll unplug the keyboard ribbon. Plug the LCD back in, like so. Stick our paper back in there like that. And at the very least, we should be able to see if the LED will come up properly now. Still not booting, huh? But it seems like without the keyboard cable attached, oh, there it kind of came up. I don't know if you saw that. So I think we'll touch up that uh, battery solder job, inspect the traces around it, and um, then we'll hook up the keyboard temporarily with the new cable do a hard reset and see if it'll boot back up then oh I see something else here too get you zoomed in on this capacitor right here oh fuzzy can you see this guy how that lead has been up right there and that is going to the system bus connector, which has all of the data bus and address bus and control signals and all that good stuff on there. And that could definitely ruin your day. So we'll pull him down there like that. Yeah, quite a few of these traces right here look kind of suspect. And they may be fine, they may not. So I'm going to use the fiberglass pin to clean that corrosion off of there. It makes pretty short work of it. Yeah, that looks like it could be a break right there. But that's going to the system bus connector. So it probably wouldn't be the end of the world. Oh yeah, that looks like there's several here. Unless you're trying to use a system bus device. Put a little alcohol in my container. Some on a Q-tip. Clean all that off of there. Yeah. The old battery did a pretty good number on this thing. Okay, well, it's cleaning up okay. We do have a few breaks and some traces, which we'll have to figure out how to repair. Yeah, okay, so. Got a break here. Here, perhaps. Start telling where that one goes. Uh, here. Yeah, there's a big chunk missing there. 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 So I think the next step is we'll smear some flux all over here. 
get our solder. And I'm just going to tin all of these traces. That will give us a better idea of what's okay and what's not. And it will help protect them. Even if they don't need any additional work done. With a combination of the fiberglass pin and going over that with some solder and then the solder braid to clean up the excess solder, this all cleaned up pretty well. Um, we wound up with about a dozen breaks and I have used uh, bodge wires in some places. You can see the tips of them sticking through here from the bottom side of the board. Uh, and I've tried to keep everything away from the battery connections that would be a really easy area to create a short and I thought I could get away with uh, just doing all the signals that didn't look related to just the system bus connection here and to see if it would boot up but that didn't work after I looked at this a little further I noticed that they snuck off traces from different places on the system bus connector which go over to areas like this. So I'm going to have to fix all of those traces to try to get it to boot. I did try and it's acting like it did before. Here you can see some of the bodge wires I've put in. I'm using wire wrap wire and you know trying to stay away from having a wire run right over the bottom of a component lead or something like that. And finding you know where this one goes that it actually made its way all the way down to here. That type of thing is kind of difficult. Just take some investigation. And you can see that connection down here and it would just you know go by following the trace. It went right here, right next to this chip, and all the way down. And once you find out where it goes then you can put a bodge wire in. Uh, in addition to the bodge wires, there was a via here which had a break right at the bottom of the ring. So I just put a stripped some of that wire wrap wire, stuck it through the hole, soldered it down like that. That'll work fine there. So you can see we've got another break here. This doesn't look too great up in this area. For a small break, you can often get away with just using some bare wire wrap wire solder directly over the trace like this or like this. Uh, for these areas right here I don't want to get too many of these types of repairs stacked up against each other because they have a tendency to short. I also want to stay away from where the battery solders in here. So I desoldered this hole at the system bus connector and cut this piece of wire wrap wire which doesn't like to stay in place there we go so it'll go over like something like this I've already made a mark with a marker where I need to cut and strip that and then it'll get soldered to the pin right here and we'll glue that down when we're done and that should make a good repair and we'll do the same thing with the trace next to it which goes to this pin right underneath here and that should make for a good repair and then we've got a few other spots like here uh, this one I'm going to try to do a, a wire jumper as well to keep it away from this hole and then so on with things like that so just do all those And I've got my little pointy tip on here, which is a little more versatile for this type of thing. I'm just going to tack that in place for now. I kind of get this roughly in the right position. And now I'm going to zoom in so I can see which pin to solder to. Turn off the autofocus. You can see I've kind of scratched into the top of the chip where I want to connect. And can 
Move that like that. Flux on there, I'll solder on the tip of my iron. Okay, and that just got it tacked on there, which is good enough for now. Can't find my tweezers, so I will just use this little screwdriver. There we go. Now I've got a nice joint on that pin. There we go. Okay. Well, a little handheld shaky cam here. Um, after about three or four hours, I've got all of these uh, eaten traces fixed up. I double checked with the multimeter, making sure there's no short trace to trace, and then all the signals are going through, and that looks okay. But it was still not booting, and I was having some weird power problems. Sometimes the current draw was twice what it should be, sometimes it was nothing. And I noticed this little dark spot right here. I wondered what that was about. And when I measured on pin 36 here on the processor, Sometimes the reset line was 4 volts, which would be okay, and sometimes it was 0 0.7 volts, which is not so okay. And concerned about what this dark spot here was, I pulled up a battery box and a little goo on the bottom there. And this mess. So the... the battery box itself really doesn't show any signs of having a corroded battery but it must have at some point or some of the goo from there happened to fall and catch in here I've seen that sort of thing happen before so I'll have to clean this up and check for signal integrity and uh, kind of like we did on the other side and we'll give it a try again There were a couple traces eaten through underneath the battery box and I put some bodge wires on the bottom to fix those. And it was booting up pretty regularly after that, but it was a little flaky. Sometimes it wouldn't any kind of wiggle things and then it would work again. Um, yeah, you can see it's, it's booted up here, but we do have some LCD corruption and I don't know if this is in the LCD itself or it is in one of the control signals. So a couple other things I found is where this factory bodge wire here is, this had come loose and it let a strand of this get to one of these connections underneath here. So I put a piece of cap tent tape right there. And this wire down here, the other end of another botch wire, had broken loose. This goes to pin 20 of the processor. Soldered that back on. And as I said, it, it boots fine now. We have the graphical corruption. It was showing 6K of RAM, which was kind of odd because it should have 32K. I pulled out this socketed RAM chip, optional RAM, and then it showed uh, 24K. Or... Yes, 32 minus 824. It's an 8K chip. Anyhow, and that showed right, and I plugged it back in, and now it's showing as it has 32K. So there must have been some connection problem there. I'll probably need to put some deoxid on that socket. Now, I'm still not sure what the issue is with the graphical corruption on the LCD. I need to measure all the address and data lines and things like that to make sure they're all okay. Uh, I went to test it with the keyboard and had some problems. Let's see if we can see here how this new keyboard cable is starting to lift off of there. That is my fault because I did not notice. The problem was yeah, 
this is not one I'm going to focus on that connector, but the connector is kind of bowed up. There's something wrong with it. So I will pull one off of a parts board, the motherboard here, and solder on here. These are the same connectors. And do my best to fix the keyboard cable. I may have another one of these, and then we can try it with the keyboard and see if we can at least scroll around and things like that. Since we saw the clock moving on the LCD, we know that the real-time clock circuitry in this area is working and it's generating an interrupt which should pull the keyboard and it updates the LCD and things like that. So we are getting there. It's just taken a while to find all this corrosion on here. I had a parts keyboard, which is missing keys and kind of nasty and dirty, but it did have a good connector. So I pulled that off there. Now we'll pull off our bad connector here. And a few of these pins are splayed out. That's probably they put this connector on the board by hand and did that to keep the connector from wobbling loose while it was going through wave soldering. So add a little fresh solder to all these joints. That always makes it easier to desolder. There we go. I think we got him straight enough. If you can at least get your desoldering tool on it, sometimes you can finish straightening it up with a desoldering tool. Like that. And there we go. Hopefully that'll pop right out of there now. It's all wiggly. There we go. Oh, this looks like there's sealant or something on it from the factory. It's rather odd looking in the... I know you can't see on the video, but it's kind of bowed in on top here too. So that may have been what did it. it curved with age and it made it too thin for the stiffener that was on the end of the flex plus that little blue spacer they put there. Huh. Okay, at any rate, let's put our new connector on. So maybe there was a problem soldering the connectors without ruining them. So they put this spacer on there. Which is where the glue came from. It's just like a piece of tape. You see that nasty yellow there? Give it one more clean. Oh, that's more better. salvaged connector in there. These connectors on the T102 are kind of an issue because nobody can seem to find a replacement, a new replacement, or some type of equivalent that could be used with a different cable. I don't know. Maybe that's a case for designing a, an adapter board. So you can use a readily available modern cable. That might work. And we'll give it a bit of a scrub. With some alcohol. I mean, there's flux all over the rest of the keyboard. Which not going to try to clean up because I don't want it to run into the switches. That would create a big problem. Just cleaning off my solder joint right there. That way if there's any little solder splatters going around, you have a better chance of cleaning them off there. Okay. Now we have a keyboard we should be able to plug in a cable to without sharing the cable. Now I have one additional spare cable from my parts stash. It should go like this with the contacts at the bottom. 
give that a try. Oh, yeah. Okay. It did plug in there, and it unplugged. So, I think we are okay to try it on the actual computer now. Okay, I've got everything hooked up again. Uh, even my spare keyboard ribbon is not in that great of shape. It was really hard getting plugged into the main board here. Um, if we turn it on... Might just be able to see there. Let me see if I can... That's a little better. You can see we still have our stripe in here. It's wherever the cursor is. Um, I can scroll around. Like, go into basic and... That works when you can see the stripe follows the cursor. Um, sometimes with that optional RAM chip in there, it'll come up and say 65K bytes free, which is wrong. I unplugged the RAM, plugged it back in, and now that's back to normal. So I think we still have some sort of bus issue on here. But it is reading the keyboard. It's trying to display. The display itself is okay, which is good. We still have something on the board here, so I think the next step is actually to probe all the address and data lines and see what's going on. And I may go ahead and socket the ROM chip, which is this guy right here, and then we can put the test harness on here and get a better idea of what's going on. But we're getting there. So the next thing I did was solder a ground wire up to a convenient spot, which just happened to be on the ground of the ROM, uh, so I could hook my scope probe up without it flapping loose. And I measured all the address and data lines. I noticed that on some of the data lines, let's say pin 12 here, I get this kind of wonky looking signal, which is indicative of some bus contention. And we have the same thing on pins. Uh, 16, 17, and 19. Now this looks funny sometimes since these lower eight uh, address slash data lines are multiplexed between, uh, between being used for address and data. You can get some funny artifacts, but generally when you see this stair step type of thing, it's a problem. If you see something that looks like a spike or little bumps on the top that's not a big deal yeah see these little spikes in here that's not as big a deal so then I get to wondering okay what is uh, else is after the the processor you know in addition to the RAM and so looking at the schematic here which I will pop up on the screen I saw the keyboard latch I see so I thought well we got a problem with that keyboard cable. And it kind of makes sense that those might have an issue. You know, if something got shorted out or whatever. So the two latches used for the keyboard are M3 and M15. And if I check here, for instance, on uh, M3, pin 13, uh, 16, 15, 14, 13. I don't think I'm on 13 there. 16, 15, 14, 13. There we go. Okay. So that is M3 pin 13. We can see that same wonky thing that we saw on the ROM, which is from 85. And then while I was testing M15, I happened to lay my hand down like this, and I noticed that after a while, M3 uh, here was getting kind of warm. So it's been on about five minutes now, and M3 is definitely warmer than M15, and they're the same chip doing the same job, so there's no reason for them to be different. Now, does this mean that M3 is bad? No, but uh, both M3 and M15 can be removed, machine will still boot but the keyboard won't work so i think that's a pretty good place to start and have a look is remove m3 since it's getting warm 
and see if that changes what our signals look like on those pins. One tricky thing with removing these chips is this is the bottom side of the board, so all of these parts are glued on. You can kind of see the glue sticking out right here. So we've got to get the middle of the chip hot enough to release that glue as well. And we'll have to do the same thing on the donor board that we're going to get this part from. And I think what I'll start with is just adding a bit of flux to these pins. You notice I've kind of protected everything else I don't want to take off or might not want to take off with some cap tan tape. Then I'll just add some solder to the pins on both sides of the chip. Now we'll go with the hot air gun. This is going to be a little noisy. Okay, it's set to about 366C. And to start with, I'm just going to try to heat up that whole area a little bit. get the solder molten. Not sure about the glue. I think we're quite there on the glue yet. Turned up the heat to 400 C. I don't seem to be getting that blue warm enough to convince it to release. There we go. Oh, that area of the board is still warm. Go ahead and clean the pads up with some braid. Seeing if I can convince that glue to stick into the braid. Yeah, that kind of got it off there. No bumps left there. I'll set our suspect bed chip here to the side. And we'll plug this back in and see if that made any difference on any of our pins. Hmm. Interestingly, the current, when I just turned it on, it was at 87 or 87 amps. No, it was not at 87 amps before. It was at 87 milliamps and now, which is kind of high, and now it's 54. Um, so we've got a nice solid 5 volts here on pin 16. And if we get down to pin 13, 16, 15, 14, 13. Now we still got that kind of stair step thing. It looks just about like it did before. Well, our current is definitely lower. Okay, well, let's try plugging the LCD in and see if that makes any difference. Try to position the LCD where you could see it here, and we'll kick it on. And we got some garbage for input because we don't have our chip in there. So those lines are kind of floating now, but that's okay. But notice the most important thing is we do not have the bars going through the cursor position. So we got rid of our graphical corruption. So it looks like our keyboard chip there was bad. Now, I don't know if that second keyboard related chip is also bad. So I'll pull one off of a donor board and we'll get that soldered in uh, position and then we will try the keyboard again or i guess we don't really need to plug the keyboard in we just need to make sure we don't get the corruption but i guess we can check the keyboard so we'll do something okay i give it a little while to cool down so all those chips are the same temperature now turn the power supply output on turn power on and we have no junk from, if you can see it there, there's no junk key presses because 
those lines aren't floating and our cursors okay so we got rid of the junk on the data bus now um i still don't know if all these repairs we did up in here are right so what i want to do is uh, desolder the ROM chip here and put a socket in so I can more easily use the test harness. And you can uh, use the test harness without socketing this chip by cutting the enable line and you know putting a test clip over it but I just might as well put a socket in that way if it you know if my friend wants to update the ROM for year 2000 appliance or something later he can do that. It won't be a big deal. So I think we've got the worst of this taken care of now. I will get this ROM socketed and we'll pop the test harness on and see what happens. So this has been a lot of work on and off, tracing down all these corroded wires and putting jumpers in there and that type of thing. Uh, but we got it to boot and we had that graphical screen corruption and we figured that out with that one bad chip. It's kind of funny on these and the Model 100's how a bad uh, data bus latch can cause LCD corruption, but the machine seems to work pretty well other than that. It's kind of an odd thing. At any rate, we figured that out, and we've got it booting now, and the screen is fine. Um, the system bus connection is not working right, though, and that's going to be a more involved repair trying to localize or isolate what that particular problem is. I have ohmed out all the connections where all those jumpers are and everything, and all that seems fine, so we're probably not you know, like turning on a latch to latch the data in or out or something like that, but it'll be a little more difficult to find. And that'll make for a good video about how to customize the code for the test harness to look for funny problems like that. So that'll be part two of this video. If you have any questions or comments, well, you know, let me know. I'm always glad to hear from you. Just leave them in the comments section down below. And thanks to everyone who helps support the Hey Burt channel through Patreon and other means. That is greatly appreciated. Well, until next time, bye.